everybody, Jennifer Schaus here coming to you live today from Washington, D.C. This is our final webinar of 2022 and the final webinar of our subcontracting series uh, this year. Um, earlier this year, we covered the FAR supplements. Uh, last year, we covered the DFARs. And the year before that, 2020, we covered every part of the FAR. All the webinars before that were either uh, covering strategical or tactical topics about government contracting, sales, marketing, uh, proposal writing, pricing, GSA schedules, uh, all of these sort of topics. So um, let's just uh, continue on with uh, our slides here. So a quick blurb about us. Uh, we are based in downtown DC and primarily work with established uh, government contractors. You can see some of the services listed there. Uh, we just had a big event on Monday night at the Kennedy Center with almost 300 people. Um, and about nine federal agencies and eight corporate sponsors, including Amazon Supply Chain. Um, get on our uh, newsletter, uh, which is free, uh, to learn about upcoming events, webinars, and conferences for next year. Uh, we now have almost 600 uh, government contracting webinars on our YouTube channel. Those are um, all complimentary and actually now have over 5,000 subscribers. Our newsletter now reaches uh, close to 25,000 subscribers and about 25,000 followers on LinkedIn. Uh, if you want to uh, learn about any of our marketing, advertising opportunities for 2023, our media kit is almost finished and we'll be happy to send that to you. Okay, uh, we do want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Set Aside Alert, Gov Events, and Fairfax County have uh, helped us in promoting these events, webinars, and conferences throughout the year. Uh, we also want to thank the Virginia PTAC. The Virginia PTAC is based out of George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, and they offer free one-on-one -on -one counseling on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on your business location. If you're interested in learning more, uh, just use the links provided on the slide or call the phone number to contact the Procurement Technical Assistance Center. Uh, Bitspeed, they were one of our sponsors on Monday night at the Kennedy Center, and they've also sponsored uh, this webinar series. Uh, they are, uh, the Bitspeed platform helps you win and increase your probability of winning government contracts. They have opportunities from every federal, state, and local public source in the United States. If you're looking for a compliance matrix, a proposal template, a strategic teaming partner, or details on an expiring contract, Bidspeed can help. They're also an official partner of the SBA's 7J Management and Technical Assistance Program. Contact Bidspeed at the email or phone number to learn more. Those are in the um, on the bottom of the slide. Okay, uh, Washington Technology provides a direct line to the contractor executives who need cutting edge IT systems and solutions to serve the largest customer in the world, the government market. Washington Technology's goal is to help attendees hear from the Justice Department leaders, leverage IT to modernize operations, engage in discussions about upcoming initiatives and analyze how contractors can support their department's mission. Uh, expert coverage and analysis fuels strategic decisions around partnering RFPs and resource development, enabling readers to build relationships, build smartly, and win contracts. Uh, GovExec, who I believe owns Washington Technology, is ready to welcome you in Tyson's Corner uh, for their January 27th event. Um, looks like you can send an email or yeah, it looks like there is actually a link there on the left-hand side of the screen. Okay, let's dig into the program. Um, we're covering Department of Veteran Affairs. We went alphabetically. Again, today's session is being recorded. It is complimentary. The slides will be on slideshare.net. You can log on to SlideShare with your um, your LinkedIn profile. And the, uh, the webinar will be posted on YouTube. Give us a couple, um, I was going to say minutes, give us a couple hours after the um, session ends to convert the MP4 over and get it uploaded. Okay, our agenda, we're going to go through some introductions. We've got two great panelists. Um, we'll cover the mission statement, uh, top vendors, legal, and we'll close out today's session with legal considerations. Okay, uh, I really want to thank uh, Archie's and me, and she has been with us from the, the start here on 
all of these webinars. She's probably very happy that today is the last webinar of the series. GovSpend is a great platform and they've put together fantastic uh, data for us. Um, Archie's, I'll let you say a few words and thank you for your time and um, all of the effort that you've put into uh, pulling the data for these webinars. Oh, thanks, Jennifer. Yes, it's uh, it's been a pleasure working on with you on these uh, webinars. So thank you for involving me. Um, yes, and uh, GovSpend actually is uh, owns FedMind. FedMind uh, is a federal database that integrates the federal data sets, and we were acquired by GovSpend, which is a leader on state local procurement information. So we now provide the best in federal and state local educational data. So happy to be here. Great, thank you. It's uh, always a pleasure to have, hear your voice on the other uh, side of the line. Uh, we've also got uh, our legal speaker, Matthew, if you wanna unmute yourself, uh, I'll give you a moment here to, to say hello. Uh, he's gonna close out today's session with the legal considerations five best practices, and uh, I think some um, FAR supplement information. So we've got Matthew uh, Moriarty from Schoonover and more, I think I'm saying it incorrectly, more already. So Matthew, I'll, I'll let you correct me and say hello to the, the group today. Hello, everyone. Uh, I, it's a mouthful, <laughs> even for me. Um, my name is Matthew Moriarty. I'm uh, one of the founding members of Schoonover and Moriarty. Um, law firm uh, on the outskirts of Kansas City that um, exclusively represents federal government contractors, almost entirely small businesses. So I am very happy to be here, very happy to be um, one of the final panelists. Um, uh, I guess uh, there's a lot to live up to, so <laughs> I hope I can make it proud. Oh, I'm sure you can. And uh, yeah, you're you're batting cleanup today for the year. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure you'll bring it home. No pressure. <laughs> OK, so uh, we'll just buzz through the mission statement, which we simply pulled from the uh, website. So if you're selling to the VA, you should probably uh, know this information already. Uh, they obviously work with uh, veterans. Um, to provide veterans the world-class benefits and services they've earned um, and uh, obviously they're focused on professionalism integrity accountability and more okay uh it's pretty simple here uh as far as what uh what encompasses the va other than that it's not simple uh as archiza and uh and matthew will tell you guys but uh, we've got the national cemetery administration uh, your benefits administration uh, Veterans National Day Committee, uh, Veterans Health Administration. Uh, and I will just give a quick shout out that if anyone lives in the DC metro area uh, over at Arlington National Cemetery, since we're talking about veterans, um, Saturday morning is the laying of the wreaths. And you can find that on the um, Arlington National Cemetery uh, website if you feel like going out in the cold and putting some wreaths on the, um, on the stones over the cemetery. Okay, uh, we've got the link to the department, uh, link to the small business office, where if you've got an opportunity and you're trying to find somebody there and uh, maybe hitting a roadblock, we encourage you to reach out to the, um, the OSDEBU if you're looking for the forecast, uh, which is also important. Uh, don't ask the OSDEBU to do that homework for you. You guys should have that done. Uh, and you should also be uh, make yourself familiar with the SBA scorecard and how they did um, over the previous years. Okay, I'm going to mute myself and uh, turn it over to Archiza. You guys are in good hands with her. And Archiza, just let me know when you're ready for your next slide and I'll advance. Perfect. So thank you everyone for being here. My name is Archiza Mian and I'm the Director of Federal Go-To-Market at GovSpend. And today we are going to be talking a little bit about subcontracting and how companies can actually use subcontracting as part of their growth strategy. Um, a little bit about the data. Uh, we've, the prime contract data comes from FPDS, which is the authoritative source for federal contract data. Um, the subcontract data actually comes from USA Spending, which gets its data from FSRS. And also keep in mind that the subcontract data is actually self-reported by the prime or the sub. Um, there are actually two data sets for subcontract. Uh, the, the data set that agencies and the SBA looks at is ESRS. However, that data set is not made public at this point. I hope it gets to be made public uh, at, 
I hope at one point there's just one data set that everyone can access. Um, but at this point, the subcontract data is coming from USA spending. Um, a little bit, you know, and before we get into the details, it's always important for us to know how do you use the data, right? Uh, while we are presenting top level data, um, I'm always going to recommend that, you know, you fine tune the searches based on the type of work that you do or the type of work you want to do. Um, and it's important as you put in filters, you understand not only who are the top primes that are winning contract at an agency, then specifically at, you know, the type of work that you want to do, who are your competitors, what are they doing, and who are they working with in terms of subcontracting. Uh, more importantly, is there a subcontract plan requirement? Uh, you know, just because subcontract data is not uh, made public for that specific contract or task order does not mean that uh, you cannot go into the prime contract detail and see if a subcontract plan is required. Um, you know, you and even if there is no plan requirement, you do want to be talking to these companies, especially if you are in the same line of work. So, um, you know, we're going to understand first and foremost the top companies within an agency. And, um, you know, uh, I think all the data helps you talk to the companies as you reach out to, allows you to be more focused and allows you to create a, a business strategy that is based on your needs and what your company does. So having said that, um, these are your top 10 companies uh, at the Department of Veterans Affairs for FY22. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, we're going to focus on the top five vendors. Um, some of the data that I'm presenting is going to be uh, just for the top five. Our first one is McKesson. Um, next slide, we'll have the link to uh, you know their small business uh, vendor information or where you can reach out to them. Uh, next slide. So uh, this is let's so let's look at you know McKesson's um, company profile. Year over year, you know, they've absolutely grown. Uh, but as you can see, based on FY22 numbers, um, the Department of Veterans Affairs is their largest client with more than $8 billion in contracts awarded. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and as you get into the detail, uh, you know, McKesson is, uh, is a pharmaceutical prime vendor at, um, the Department of Veterans Affairs and supplies a large portion of uh, their uh, medical uh, supplies. Um, and you can also further see that, um, you know, it is, uh, it, it, the company, you know, is winning contracts, of course, as other than small business, and they do have a commercial subcontract plan available. Next slide. So let's look at some of the subcontracts that they themselves have won on the right hand side. You can see the companies that they've won subcontracts from. Um, and of course, if we get into details, you could see what type of um, you know, subcontract it is. But from our perspective, you can also see that they have uh, made some information about some of the subcontracts that they have awarded public. And you could see Veterans Construction Inc. And I, I looked up before our call, and some of the contracts, subcontracts that this company got was for labor. Uh, UPS and uh, CELO are the top subcontracts that that have been reported for FY21. So again, you know, McKesson, of course, pharmaceutical company. However, I always recommend, you know you can always talk to them. There are always subcontract opportunities that are out there, or even you never know, there could be some teaming opportunities. So um, next company is um, TriWest Healthcare Alliance. Um, next slide. Um, here is the link for, them, for you to reach out to them uh, and get to be part of the outreach program. Um, so, 
their profile is a lot easier and simpler but you can absolutely see that they have grown uh, you know from fy 21 when they were about three odd billion dollars to more than seven billion dollars in fy 22 but definitely the va is the largest and maybe only uh, agency that they are working with on the federal side uh, next slide if we get into the type of work that they do, um, they seem to have contracts for uh, the community center uh, contracts uh, at patient center, community centers uh, out is, is what they seem to be winning the contracts for. Um, and you could see that there is an individual subcontract plan uh, that is also required as part of this contract. Um, next slide. Um, and if you go further into the type of NAICS codes that they are winning contracts, and this is another way that you could actually see if there are any subcontracts that are out there based on NAICS codes. Um, but you could see that a lot of their subcon, uh, a lot of their prime contracts are in the direct health center carrier, medical insurance carrier type NAICS codes. So it's always interesting. Oh, and then they also have some. Um, contracts that are awarded under the Office of Physicians uh, NICS code. Uh, so next slide. So there was no subcontract data that was uh, made public for uh, the previous company. Um, so let's go into Sona Government Services. Uh, this is the third largest prime contractor at the Department of Veterans Affairs for FY22. Uh, here is the link to contact them if you want to work with them. Next slide. Um, and, and one thing that I'm always going to say that, you know, as you go through information, as you pay attention on who's winning, what type of work are they winning, run expiring contract searches and create your strategy, uh, paying attention to the subcontract requirements, possible subcontractors that they could work with, um, you know, gathering all that information about a specific company um, not only helps you uh, get that transparency into what that company is doing, but more importantly, when you approach the company, you're able to weave in all that information as you're talking to them. Um, and you're going from the perspective of having taken the time and effort to learn more about your prospect and the type of work that you want to work with them on. And I think it just sort of gives you a, a big edge, I think, when you start um, using all the data and information that you have with you. Um, so for Cerna, you could see that they do have a few contracts with Army and HHS. However, the Department of Veterans Affairs is the largest client. Uh, you know, they've grown almost doubled in FY22 based on FY by, you know, based on FY21 numbers at almost $2 billion. Uh, next slide. And if we go into details for all the contracts Cerner's got, you actually could see that they're really working on the electronic health uh, modernization with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, you know, and on the right hand side, you could actually see that major solicitation um that uh, you know the that is made public and you can actually go in look at the documents get a better understanding of what the contract is um, there, there is an individual subcontract plan requirement so again that provides you with more information on how you could provide value to the Cerner or any other prime that you want to work with um, it always helps uh, conversations move ahead uh, next slide um, so right here, you could see on the right-hand side that Bruce Allen uh, did give some subcontract work to Cerner way back in FY21 uh, for about $4 million. Um, they've also done some work for MITRE in the past, um, uh, beyond 2019, or earlier than 2019. Um, also, you could see some of the subcontractors that they've worked with and reported data on uh, going back to FY29. But this does give you some information of possible subcontractors that they could already be working with 
they've just not reported it into the FSRS system, which is why it's not in here. Um, so next slide. And then again, you can, uh, I thought it's helpful in this case to actually see the NAICS codes that contracts are being awarded under a lot of computer related NAICS codes, which sort of goes in with the type of work that they're doing. So I wanted to share some of that information. Uh, next slide. Um, so the fourth company that I want, that we are gonna cover is QTC Medical Services. Um, next slide. We'll have the link to contact them. Um, next slide is a look at the contracts that this company has won. Um, they have a pretty robust federal uh, platform, uh, you know, federal book of business um, with some work at Homeland Security, HHS, and Railroad Retirement Board. However, their major client is the Department of Veterans Affairs, where they've done uh, more than $900 million, $925 million in FY22. Um, next slide. And you can see that the type of work that they're really doing is a lot of medical disability examinations um, under the Veterans Benefits Improvement Act. Um, you could also see they do a lot of free discharge medical disability examinations, but uh, truly it's all in the medical uh, disability examination that, um, you know, that is their core competency and the service that they provide to the Department of Veterans Affairs. And again, they do seem to have a commercial subcontract plan requirement. So uh, definitely if you are able to provide um, and be of assistance, you could see that, you know, with that subcontract plan requirement, um, this is absolutely uh, something that you could reach out to them. Um, but the next slide uh, is again, just a quick look at the NAICS codes. And again, Office of Physicians uh, is where they've got all their contract uh, awards in, under. And next slide, I'm not sure um, if they've actually reported any subcontract data. So getting into that transactional level detail and understanding if there is a subcontract plan requirement gets to be even more important. Um, the fifth company that we're gonna to touch on is the Veterans Evaluation Services. Um, next slide, we'll have the link for contacting them um, and, and getting in touch with them. Um, next slide is, um, you know, again, Department of Veterans Affairs is their only client uh, where they did more than $690 million in contracts in FY22. And again, for them, it's all under the NAICS code of Office of Physicians. So, um, you know, the last two companies definitely did a lot of work uh, with the disability examinations. Um, next slide. This company too is doing uh, medical disability examinations um, for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, and then it also has a commercial subcontract plan requirement. Next slide. Um, yep, yeah, so that is, uh, you know, just uh, the, a quick look at um, my slides and the top five primes that are at the Department of Veterans Affairs, the type of work that they do. And hopefully, um, you know, if you have any questions, absolutely feel free to reach out to me. And Jennifer, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Super, thank you, Archisa. It was great to, uh, to have the fantastic data. And uh, we'd encourage anyone that's interested in being a subcontractor to use the FedMine uh, GovSpend platform. We'll have Archisa's information again on the last slide. So please contact her. Um, their platform is really easy to use and it's uh, just great for staying abreast of opportunities and looking at forecasts and, and everything else that you need in um, capturing contracts. Uh, we'd also encourage you to make sure that you register on any of the uh, vendors website because once you contact these folks that's the first thing they're going to ask you is if you've registered on their website as a small business vendor. So. Uh, try to beat them to the chase and make sure you bring them an opportunity and not uh, asking them what they have available because you're just going to blend into the crowd.
Jennifer, I guess uh, this is uh, my uh, my turn to speak. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I think I unmuted myself uh, or muted myself by accident. Let me just uh, buzz through these real quick. Sorry. Um, so yeah, we just want to make sure that uh, you're using the FedMine or GovSpend platform to do your homework before you start reaching out to either the government directly or to any of the prime contractors. Um, we provided all the links so you can register uh, as a small business vendor, and it takes about two minutes to find those. Um, so if you're going beyond the top five and you're kind of um, uh, looking at other companies, that's always a best practice. Um, and make sure that everything that you've got in your SAM registration matches what you put um, in the vendor's uh, profile as well. Uh, if you're looking at LinkedIn, you'd be looking for the SBLOs for these companies, which is the Small Business Liaison Officers. Um, sometimes it's the Office of Diversity, sometimes uh, maybe a um, uh, there could be a subcontract administrator. That person's going to be more focused on the paperwork, not necessarily finding um, small businesses to work with. So just uh, keep that in mind. Um, and just make sure that you're um, staying abreast of what that company does. Like if you're going to focus on one or two uh, companies to pursue, make sure that you know them and know them well. And you know, you know, if they've been in the news for anything positive or negative. Um, they usually will list the associations where they're active, if they're speaking, if they're exhibiting. Uh, use those again as opportunities to start building your relationships because at the end of the day, it does come down to just that. Um, and bring them an opportunity if you uh, knock on their door and say, hey, what have you got for me? I'm a 8A or I'm a hub zone. Um, they do not have a hard time finding 8A companies, uh, veteran known hub zone or uh, any of the other check boxes. What they do have a hard time finding uh, are companies that have the past performance, that have the wherewithal, the financial strength to perform um, as a subcontractor. So uh, bring them the opportunity, do your homework, otherwise you're simply going to blend in with all of the other subcontractors that are out there. Um, so again, register on their website as a small business vendor before you contact them. I think that's and I think that's all that I have here. So I'm going to try to advance the slide. Okay, uh, Matthew, over to you. I'm going to mute myself and just let me know when you're ready for your next slide. Okay, thank you so much. Um, what I'm going to do uh, in the brief time that I'm going to speak to you is talk a little bit about um, the basics of uh, subcontracting, specifically with the VA. I'm going to talk a little bit more after that about some far flow down clauses and explain what those are and how they um, may come into play in your contract work. And then uh, finish up with just a little bit more about um, um, subcontracting uh, in a broader sense uh, issues to be aware of. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Again, this is just me, this is my contact information. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me by email if you have any questions about any of this um, or just, uh, you know, Google Schoonover Moriarty and we'll pop right up. Thanks. Next slide, please. So uh, really basic. Everybody knows this already, but I find it's a good um, way to sort of reset the conversation. The relationship that we talk about when we talk about subcontracting is sort of the quintessential teaming relationship in federal contracting. It is um, a company, the prime has a contract with the federal government and it chooses to hire a subcontractor to assist with performance of that contract. Uh, the prime contractor is the only party that has privity of contract with the federal government and it therefore is the only party that is responsible for performance. So uh, as a potential subcontractor, one of the things that primes will be uh, interested in knowing is your capability to ensure performance. That's a little bit of um, the past performance uh, that Jennifer was just talking about. Um, importantly, prime sub is not a joint venture. A joint venture is an entirely different thing that is in fact a independent legal entity that consists of more than one company. 
um, uh, a prime subrelationship is going to be governed by state law. So if the prime uh, and subcontract are entered into in, let's say, the state of Florida, then the state of Florida law, um, uh, contract law, would help you interpret that contract. There are, however, FAR provisions that apply, and we will be talking about some of them shortly. Next slide, please. Pardon me. Um, so with the VA, the VA sets some pretty excellent um, subcontracting goals, uh, pretty excellent small business contracting goals. Um, and they are here. Um, uh, this comes from the 2021 SBA um, scorecard, uh, where it takes a look at um, how well each agency did in uh, meeting its goals. For the prime uh, contracting to small businesses um, and um, STVOSBs, the VA did quite good. Um, its goal for small businesses was just over 28%. It hit 30 uh, for STVOSBs. Its goal was 3% and it hit 24, almost 24. Now, um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that the VA has the rule of two, uh, which I'm sure you're aware of, uh, which states that if the VA has um, reason to believe it will receive more than two um, uh, offers from capable and affordable SDVOSBs, uh, reasonably priced SDVOSBs, then um, it must set aside that work for STVOSBs. Now, it did not do so well with WOSBs and hub zone contract, um, contractors, but it did great with disadvantaged contractors. Now, when you look at subcontracts, that's where things get a little bit worse. Um, the goal was 16% of all subcontracts would go to small businesses. It only hit 13 STVOSBs, far below the goal. Uh, which was 3%, um, disadvantaged below the goal, uh, which was 5%, and and on and on down the line. Um, so subcontract, doing fine on the prime pretty much. Subcontracting is where uh, the VA could use some work. Um, let's take a look at the next slide, please. We don't know yet. Um, we know how the VA did in 2021 fiscal year. We don't know yet how it did in 2022, but here are the goals. Um, this is for prime contracting. Um, so uh, a small business, the, the VA wanted 17.5% to go um, of contracts to go to um, small businesses. VOSB, that's just veteran-owned small business, 7%. STVOSB, 5%. Um, those STVOSB contracts do count as VOSB contracts. So, you know, chances are um, the VA is going to hit that again by a lot. Um, and, and on and on down the line, you can see what it is. Next slide, please. A, where um, the VA shines in, uh, and this is not just uh, the VA, but across the board uh, at, at many agencies, is when a um, contract requires an individual subcontracting plan. So um, uh, when a large business uh, receives a contract from the VA, in certain circumstances, it is required um, to uh, institute a subcontracting plan um, uh, that includes goals and uh, um, dollar amounts. Um, so that uh, occurs when the prime contract is worth more than uh, three quarters of a million dollars um, or uh, 1.5 million for construction. Um, and that subcontracting plan must be in place prior to award. Um, however, it does not apply when the prime contractor is a small business or um, the value is not up to where um, uh, the, uh, uh, the previous level that we talked about, uh, three quarters of a million dollars or 1.5 million for construction. Also, it does not apply on contracts where there are no subcontracting opportunities for contracts that are performed entirely outside of the United States. Next slide, please. Do you have to be verified to subcontract to a prime contractor at the VA? Well, if it's going to count towards 
that SD VOSB or VOSB goal, then yes, to be credited towards goal achievements, a business must be ver verified as eligible in the VIP database. Uh, as you know, um, right now there's a, a transfer from uh, the, VA, the VA's um, Center for Verification and Evaluation. The SDVOSP program verification is transferring from that office in the VA to the SBA. Um, and that means that verification is uh, currently, uh, applications for verification are currently closed right now. Uh, they'll open again in the new year. Um, but uh, regardless, um, you know, if you're an SDV OSB or VOSB, uh, know that in order for a large prime to count your participation towards the subcontracting plan goal, which would then count towards the VA's goal, um, the, you must be verified. You cannot just be um, self-certified like you can at the SBA. Uh, next slide, please. A prime is going to have to report its compliance with its uh, subcontracting plan, should one be required. Um, uh, the plan, uh, if, if goals are not met, that does not represent a breach of contract. What it does is um, it uh, only requires that the prime make a good faith effort to uh, meet its goals. However, if there is a failure to make a good faith effort, then we are talking about a breach of contract and um, possible uh, CPARS uh, negative evaluation. Um, so how do they report that? They report that through the uh, electronic subcontracting reporting system at the VA. Um, and uh, when that occurs, it's possible that the VA will institute a subcontracting plan compliance review. And that could be in the form of a on-site visit or um, an off-site um, investigation. Um, next slide, please. This will give you an idea of, of what's going on. Um, so when the VA um, has an individual subcontracting plan associated with its um, prime contract, then um, the performance is great pretty much across the board. According to the SBA, the VA achieved 23.9% uh, small business participation when there is an individual contract specific plan associated with performance on a contract. Now, uh, when there is no individual um, uh, plan associated with a contract, so when a subcontractor, uh, subcontracting plan is not required, in case uh, uh, circumstances like we said before, when there are no subcontracting opportunities, uh, when the contract is performed not in the United States, when the contract is less than uh, three quarters of a million dollars or 1.5 million uh, for construction, um, then uh, the VA does not do as well. Um, well, I should say the primes who are working for the VA do not do as well um, at getting um, uh, small businesses and uh, socioeconomic businesses to participate. So what, what the difference here is an individual plan is contract specific. It's required by the contract. The contractor ha has to make a good faith effort. If they don't, it's a breach of contract. Or you have what's called a commercial plan, which is just the entity's overall, the prime contractor's overall goals um, for, sub, uh, for a small business subcontractor um, participation, those plans uh, do not do nearly as well. Um, this again comes from the SBA's 2021 uh, agency scorecard. So we don't know yet what the numbers look like for 2022, but chances are they're quite similar. Um, next slide, please. Uh, a lot of this was already brought up, um, uh, but I did want to uh, let you know that um, you do have some resources as potential subcontractors that you can um, uh, use to find companies to work for. Um, so the VA has a large business prime contractor list um, uh, for uh, contractors who must establish those subcontracting plans with goals. Um, the list is over 7,000 um, companies long. 
Um, so, you know, it, it could give you, you know, uh, beyond those uh, 20, 30 um, uh, contractors like Cerner um, that you, you're you well aware of, there are um, um, thousands of contractors who need small business participation as part of their work. Um, so uh, one of the things you could look at is vetbiz. Uh, va.gov backslash services backslash backslash subcontracting and you can also look at the SBA's subnet uh, which is a website for prime contractors to post subcontracting opportunities I can tell you my experience the subnet is a little touchy um, to work but that doesn't mean it can't be you know if you have the skills uh, to navigate it well um, it can certainly be a useful resource. Uh, next slide, please. Want to talk a little bit about um, FAR flowdown clauses. So when a prime contractor um, uh, uh, hires a sub, one of the things the prime contractor must do is include certain FAR clauses in the subcontract that it is offering. Um, uh, the FAR clause in general will say something like the contractor shall include the substance of this clause in all subcontracts and all contracts with agents um, as a subcontractor one thing that you will need to note is that if there's a far flow down in your subcontract and you want to um, subcontract further on down the line you uh, also are going to are going to have a responsibility to include that flow down clause in your um, second tier subcontract next slide please common flow down clauses include contractor code of business ethics and conduct um, this is a requirement um, that you uh, have uh, a code of business ethics um, then that clause is going to apply if a subcontract has a very large value greater than 5.5 million and has a period of performance longer than 120 uh, days. Um, another common one is utilization of small business concerns. That uh, certainly makes sense. Um, and that also only flows down um, uh, if the subcontractor is going to offer further subcontracting opportunities. And um, the uh, actually, I should say that this uh, subcontract is less than 750,000. Um, so this is a, an old number. Uh, it's been increased. It's, this is the same number we talked about before, three quarters of a million or 1.5 million for um, construction. Um, but, you know, there is no need to flow anything down to a small business subcontractor because uh, those flow downs, in this circumstance, the utilization of small business concerns does not apply to small businesses. Next slide, please. Here are a couple more um, that just tend to come up a lot uh, that you should keep an eye out for. Uh, option to extend services, that's that uh, clause that says, hey, the government may need another, I don't know, six months out of this work. Um, uh, you may, if you're a prime, you might want to put that in your subcontract just so the subcon, if, if the agency um, uh, elects uh, to use that flow down or that option, um, you don't want to uh, be renegotiating with a subcontractor at that time. Um, other ones that uh, are potentially optional, trafficking in persons, um, limitation on the use or disclosure of third-party contractor reported cyber incident information. That's a, a DFARS clause um, regarding cybersecurity, um, safeguarding covered defense information and cyber incident reporting. That's another DFARS clause um, regarding uh, cybersecurity to keep an eye out for um, and adequate COVID-19 safety protocols for federal contractors. Again, that's one, um, that's a DFARS clause that may be included in a prime contract. Um, and uh, it could be in the form of a VAR uh, clause, the VA FAR supplement um, as well. So. Just FYI, stuff to keep an eye out for. Uh, next slide, please. This is kind of the last part of this, um, part of uh, my presentation. I just wanted to talk in general about some things to think about 
uh, as a subcontractor. Um, so one of the key issues that comes up a lot is that the prime is going to have, if you're a small business prime, you're going to have a limit on how much work that you can subcontract out to entities that are not similarly situated. So um, we'll get to what similarly situated means um, and uh, um, uh, more uh, information about some of these other um, terms. But in general, uh, if it's a services contract, the small business prime is going to have to do at least 50% of the work itself. So it has to keep half of the contract and it can subcontract out another half of the contract supplies or products um, uh, the company the prime contractor is going to have to manufacture do at least 15 percent of the manufacturing or it's going to have to qualify as a non-manufacturer um, uh, through some uh, a uh, an exception called the non-manufacturer rule which we'll talk about in a second um, specialty trade construction um, think of that as like uh, roofers um, the limitation there is going to be 75%. Now, that's the amount that can be subcontracted out, meaning the specialty trade prime contractor has to keep a quarter of the work. And in general construction, that number is less that the, the prime contractor has to keep. Uh, it can subcontract out as much as 85% of that work two large businesses. This makes sense in construction because most of a construction job, the prime contractor's um, responsibility is to run the job um, and to keep uh, the various subcontractors on the critical path. Um, so, um, by the way, what does a, a, a manufactured item mean? Um, uh, if it's, uh, if we're looking at a supplier product, the small business must manufacture the end item unless the non-manufacturer rule applies, if that makes sense. And by must manufacture, I mean, do at least 50% of the manufacturing. Next slide, please. I mentioned similarly situated entity. So, um, sorry, next slide, please. You can, uh, if you're a small business prime and you are worried about compliance with the limitation on subcontracting, one of the things that you can do is you can subcontract to what's called a similarly situated entity. And that uh, subcontract is not considered to be subcontracted work. So a similarly situated entity is um, an entity that shares the prime contractor's socioeconomic designation and is small under the subcontract NAICS code. Um, so if I am a prime contractor, I'm an SDVOSB, and I know that I don't have the capability to do 50% of a services contract, I can hire another SDVOSB because they have the same socioeconomic designation as me to help me um, uh, collectively have uh, 50 percent of the work performed by SDVOSBs. Now, if I'm the prime in that circumstance, one of the important things for me to do is to assign a NAICS code to the subcontract. Um, and that NAICS code does not necessarily have to match the prime contract NAICS code, although it makes sense that you would because you want to make sure that that entity is also small um, under the NAICS code assigned to the subcontract. You wouldn't necessarily assign a smaller uh, NAICS code to that work, if that makes sense. So again, this is a way um, that a small business prime can use a subcontractor that has the same social economic status to comply with the limitation on subcontracting without actually performing uh, more than 50% of that work. Next slide, please. This is, I believe, uh, the second to last slide. So um, I'm again, I appreciate everybody bearing with us. The non-manufacturer rule I mentioned before, um, this allows a small business that did not manufacture uh, the product to um, 
provide the product to the federal government um, uh, as a small business. So uh, uh, the prime would then have to be smaller than, have less than 500 employees. It would have to be primarily engaged in trade that normally sells the item being sold. Uh, and it must either take ownership or possession of the product um, uh, according to the norms of the industry. So uh, for example, if you're the type of entity that um, is a reseller and generally has um, uh, the product shipped from um, the wholesaler to the customer, um, in transit, that product can become your legal property and in that circumstance, you can comply with the non-manufacturer rule by taking ownership um, during uh, transit. Um, lastly, uh, the prime has to supply the end item of a small business manufacturer, unless um, there is a waiver. There are two types of waivers, class waivers or um, uh, individual waivers. Individual waiver is a waiver that is uh, put in place for the specific contract. A class waiver is a waiver that is in place for the class of item. So um, let's take like a battery, for example. That's a bad example because it's commercial off the shelf, but if you just bear with me, a battery is not gonna be made in America by a small business manufacturer. Um, so there's gonna be a class waiver in place to allow um, uh, a, a small business to uh, provide that item, even though it's made by a large business. Okay, last slide, please. The last thing to keep an eye out uh, if you're a prime or a sub is to avoid being seen as an ostensible subcontractor. What that is, is a subcontractor that comes in that essentially runs a job. The prime is there just in name only. Um, you can wind up finding yourself being an ostensible subcontractor if you perform the primary and vital work or the prime contractor is too reliant on you to perform without you. So if you're a subcontractor and you're talking to a prime and let's say the work is um, um, earth moving, um, they say they're going to run the contract and you know, you're the one with the bulldozer, you're the one um, that has the experience doing the earth moving, chances are you're going to be doing the primary and vital work um, or um, the prime contractor is going to be too reliant on you to do the work without you, um, if that makes sense. Um, that is all that I have. Um, so I will um, turn it back over to Jennifer. Excellent presentation, Matthew. Really enjoyed the, uh, the content and your insight into working with the VA. Uh, obviously, a couple of complexities in there. So thanks for the time that you uh, took to put together all of the content and the time that you took today to present to our audience. Really appreciate it. Thank you and for having also, me. Great, thanks. And also a special thanks to Archisa Meehan from GovSpend. If anyone's interested in um, signing up for the GovSpend platform, uh, I think they do maybe a trial for a week or so. Um, I would highly encourage you to use data, whether it's uh, SAM.gov, FPDS, some of the GSA sites, or by going to one of the paid platforms uh, that includes uh, a comprehensive pool from all of these various sites. Uh, you definitely need data to make decisions. So uh, don't just be reactive to what you see as far as opportunities. Make sure you've got a strategic plan and relationships in place uh, before you start responding. Uh, and that's a wrap for today. It's a wrap for our 2022 webinar series. Uh, if you're not signed up for our newsletter, you can do so on our website, jennifershouse.com, and you will be alerted of the webinar series that we're covering for 2023, as well as uh, advertising and sponsorship opportunities. So thanks again, everybody, uh, for joining us this year and today. Uh, thanks again to Archiza and Matthew for putting together a great presentation. And have a good uh, rest of the day. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, or whatever it is you celebrate. Uh, thanks, everybody.